thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, very pleased to be able to update you on some of the new developments we have in the cath lab and some very exciting things we're doing down there. Um, so I wanted to talk today about protected PCI. So I wanted to start with some definitions. Uh, the first one is, what is a PCI? Uh, PCI stands for percutaneous, which means we go through the skin. Um, it doesn't involve surgery. It's a minimally invasive procedure. It usually involves a catheter, uh, which is inserted like an ID, uh, into an artery or a vein. Um, we work on the coronary arteries, which are arteries that run down the surface of the heart. And they supply the heart with blood. So it's the heart's own blood supply. The heart is a big muscle. It needs blood just like any other muscle. In fact, it needs quite a bit of blood in order to function. And so these are the arteries that uh, supply the heart itself with blood. And then an intervention is just any kind of procedure that we do on these arteries to um, make them work better. Um, so this is uh, what an angioplasty or a stent entails. Um, Again, uh, we open uh, blocked arteries, the coronary arteries. So the coronary arteries run along the surface of the heart. Um, and again, they supply the heart itself with blood. Um, so if there's a blockage in your artery, we can go in there with a balloon and a stent. And we expand the balloon, which uh, opens up the blockage. And then usually we leave a stent behind, which is a scaffolding. Um, your arteries are very elastic. So if we just uh, open them up, they'll collapse again. And the stand acts like a scaffolding to keep the uh, artery from collapsing. Um, so this is sort of a blow up of that. Um, again, you have a plaque here, which uh, is a blocked artery. And then we go in, we play the balloon, which has a stent on top of it. And then we deflate the balloon, we remove the balloon, and the stent stays behind and keeps the artery open. This is a coronary angiogram. So this is what it looks like in the cath lab. Um, we take a catheter, this comes up either through the wrist. Uh, the artery in the wrist or the leg, and we engage the artery that runs along the surface of the heart, and we inject dye in there, and so that will opacify the artery so that we can see it under x-ray. And here you can see the artery is blocked, there's no flow going through there, and then after we put the stent in, the artery is opened up, and it looks normal again, so we reestablish it. So we have a new device, which has only been around for maybe four or five years. It's called an impella. It's a heart pump. Um, and the way this device works is you can insert it inside the heart itself, inside the heart chamber. And it takes blood up through the inlet. And there's a uh, impella, which is a propeller that's inside the catheter, which spins very quickly, uh, 30 to 50,000 RPM. And it sucks the blood up from the ventricle and then ejects it into the aorta so it supplies blood to the whole body and it takes over the pumping action of the heart. So this allows the heart to rest um, and it also supplies blood to the body and to the heart itself while, while we're doing the procedure which allows us to work on the heart itself. Um, you've probably seen commercials for this device on television. Um, it shows folks uh, living great lives, playing golf and sailing away into the sunset. Um, and, you know, this isn't just a marketing blitz, this is actually uh, what we do in the cath lab, and this is what we aim for, is to get people back to fully functional lives and able to do the things that they enjoy. Um, so, again, the impeller device goes in uh, percutaneously, so it goes in through uh, your leg into your femoral artery, which runs uh, right at the proximal part, the origin of your leg, and then we can Negotiate that up, up your aorta and then into your ventricle. This is the heart yourself, itself. Um, so this is what the impala looks like inside the heart. This is the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. So when this squeezes, it ejects uh, oxygen-rich blood out into the aorta and into all parts of your body. Uh, so the pump sits in the left ventricle and it, it takes blood up from the ventricle and then shoots it out into the aorta. Um, so this can take over the pumping action of the heart. Uh, this is a schematic of the device that works. Uh, again, it uh, takes blood up here in the inlet, which is inside the ventricle, so the heart doesn't have to squeeze as hard. And then it pumps the blood up and then it ejects it here in the aorta which ejects it out into the rest of the body. 
Uh, this is what the device looks like under x-ray. Uh, so again, it's sitting inside the heart itself. Uh, it's taking blood up here and injecting it out into the aorta. Um, so what kind of patients do we use this on? Uh, there's really three main categories. One would be a patient that has a lot of uh, other medical conditions, maybe not cardiac conditions, that make them high risk. They might have diabetes, they might be older, um, they may have had surgery in the past or um, heart attacks in the past, they might have bad lung disease, uh, any kind of condition that makes them high risk for having surgery. So they really can't have surgery, they have to have the procedure performed uh, in the cath lab um, with this pump for support. The other category that we use is patients with very complicated disease. So these are patients who have uh, blockages in main arteries of the heart or multiple blockages in many different arteries in the heart. And then the other category is individuals who have weak hearts. Um, so they may have had heart attacks in the past or they have heart failure, their hearts are weak uh, and they have very high risk. Um, they have very little reserves, so if you start to work on their heart, um, their heart can't handle that very well. Um, so these are the effects from the impellent vice. Um, so again, it takes up blood here and injects it out into the body, and this allows us to increase the flow to the body. Okay, so uh, it actually enhances the normal pumping action of the heart, so we can essentially double the flow that goes out to your body uh, by using this pump. Uh, it increases your pressure, MAP stands for mean arterial pressure. I'm going to be using that term a lot. Basically, it's just your blood pressure. So uh, the pump will allow us to increase your blood pressure, which allows us to do more work on the heart. Um, it decreases the pressure inside the heart. Okay, so by taking the blood out of the heart and injecting it into the body, the pressure inside the heart itself is lower, which the heart likes a lot. So the heart doesn't have to work as hard uh, when there's less pressure inside the heart, and then we can get more blood supply to the heart itself, uh, which allows the heart to rest. Um, this is a uh, schematic of a, a real patient um, who had an impellent in place, um, and this is uh, the blood pressure, and this is time. So what they did here is they shut the impella off, and the patient's blood pressure fell. Um, if the MAP, which is again the mean arterial pressure, falls to less than 60, that's critical. Uh, this patient is not going to survive very long with a blood pressure that low. Uh, and incompetently, um, the blood pressure inside the heart rises. We like to have this under 20. Uh, so when they shut the impella off, the patient's blood pressure fell, the pressure went up inside the heart. And here they turn the pump on. And then within a matter of seconds, the blood pressure comes back down to normal, or it's at a safe level. And the pressure inside the heart falls to a safe level. So this is just uh, a real world representation of what goes on when uh, we're using the pump. Uh, I don't want to bore you with too much data. I only have a couple of slides here. But uh, this is information from a registry. This is a worldwide registry of patients who've had this um, device used. And uh, before the pump was put in, their average blood pressure was 60, which is pretty borderline. And then once we put the pump in, we can increase their blood pressure by 50%. Um, their cardiac output was low, which is the amount of blood that your heart pumps every minute. And again, by putting the pump in, um, we can increase cardiac output by over 50%. Uh, and again, the pressure inside the heart falls. Uh, again, we like to have this under 20, and uh, we can drop the pressure inside the heart by about 40% by using this pump. Um, this pump allows us to treat more vessels. Um, so this, is, again, is from the registry data. Uh, and it shows that um, when we treat, the more vessels you treat, uh, your blood pressure tends to fall. These patients have more extensive disease and you're doing more work on the heart. But when we have the impella in place, we get less drops in blood pressure, which allows us to treat more vessels and do more extensive work on the heart. Uh, and so this is a representation of outcomes at 90 days in patients who have had the impella used versus those who didn't have the impella. Uh, and these are complication rates. <clears throat> so you can see that patients who have the uh, impella used have a 30% reduction in uh, complications up to uh, 90 days versus patients who 
you didn't have the income you use, now you might say there's a 20% complication rate, which seems kind of high. But keep in mind these patients are very high risk. Um, they have a lot of other medical conditions. Um, so if you didn't do the intervention at all, if you didn't work on their heart at all, their mortality would probably be like 50% at 90 days. So we're able to substantially improve their survival and their quality of life as well by doing these procedures. Um, this is my last slide, and I hope I'm not uh, boring you too much, but um, this represents, um, again, after the procedure is performed, these are outcomes data. Uh, in general, we increase um, the heart function by 22% after the procedure, after we um, uh, revascularize the heart, open up the blockages, um, you know, by using the pump for support, we can increase the heart function by 22% on average. And probably more importantly, patients feel better. So um, this is a graph of uh, patient symptoms. And the patients with uh, you know, green or blue in, in this graph uh, have very minimal symptoms. They actually are able to do uh, quite a bit. They're very functional. They can do pretty much everything they want to do. People with the red are pretty severely impaired, uh, they get symptomatic even just doing normal activities like getting dressed or taking a shower, and people in the gray or have symptoms even at rest. Um, so by doing these procedures with the pump and support, um, we can reduce the number of people with severe symptoms by uh, 58%. And you can see that after the procedure, about 75% of our patients have very functional lives with <clears throat> pretty minimal symptoms. Um, I hope I haven't stunned you with too many graphs and data. Uh, and actually, I'd like to talk about some real-world patients at this point. Um, these patients have given us permission to use their information, even though we're not using any uh, protected health information uh, in reviewing these uh, cases. The first patient I want to talk about is a 77-year-old woman who's treated here. Um, she has a history of three vessel coronary bypass, so she had heart surgery in the past and had a three vessel bypass before in 2014. Um, she was admitted about a year ago with um, heart failure and a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack. Um, she was stabilized on the board. Um, her heart function had fallen. She started out with a normal heart ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood your heart uh, squeezes. Uh, ejects with each squeeze. Um, initially it was normal, but after her heart attack and her heart failure episode, um, it had fallen to 40%, which is moderately impaired. Um, so we did a cardiac cath on her, and she had a very high grade um, calcified blockage, um, which was like a, a rock of calcium in her main coronary artery supplying um, heart to her blood. Uh, this artery supplies about two thirds of your blood supply to your heart. So obviously they have a bad blockage there, you're not going to do well. Um, she had been bypassed, but uh, two out of her three bypass grafts were occluded, they were blocked off. So she was essentially living off of one of her grafts. Um, she was a poor candidate for repeat surgery because she was older, um, she had a bypass in the past, her heart function was low, so she would have been very high risk from having open heart, repeat open heart surgery. So we did a coronary angiogram on her, and uh, this is her blockage here. There's a 90% blockage uh, right here, right? So, um, you know, again, this is contrast in the arteries. We expect this to just completely fill the artery, but you can see there's a filling defect here. So uh, there's a big blockage here that's blocking the flow. And uh, this is another picture of it. Again, this is the main artery uh, coming off your aorta. And this blockage is this complex. It's sitting here and it's extending out into this artery. It's very high in blockage. Uh, this is the impeller device inside her heart. That's what it looks like under x ray. Um, so, uh, using the impeller, we were able to go in and open up this artery. We put a stent here. You can see that the blockage is mostly gone. Uh, we actually had to use a high speed drill to, because the blockage was so hard that we went in there with a drill and and we drilled out a channel, and then we were able to put a stent in back in there. So, uh, so we used rotational atherectomy, which is a drill. It's kind of like our dentist drill that we can put inside your heart, and it'll uh, only drill out uh, 
blockages that are very hard and won't have any effect on soft tissue. Um, so we were able to drill out the artery. Um, she did great. She didn't have any complications related to this procedure. Um, she was discharged from the hospital the next day. Uh, and I saw her recently. Uh, this is one year up from her event. Uh, she's doing great. She's exercising four or five times a week. Uh, she's going to the gym. She's walking two miles a day. Um, and her heart function has returned to normal. So she started out with a weak heart. And our function has rebounded and it's completely normal now. So we're very happy uh, that we were able to help this one. Um, another case I want to talk with you about is a 60 year old woman we treated here a couple months ago. Um, she had a transcatheter earth valve placed in August. So we, uh, she had a, a narrowing in her heart valve. So we went in with a catheter, we replaced her valve inside her heart by using a catheter technique similar to what I just described to you. Um, but uh, So that was done in August, and she came in uh, in March with heart failure. Um, and her heart function was extremely depressed. Um, her heart was only beating about 10 or 15 percent uh, of what it should be. Um, we did a heart cap procedure on her, and it demonstrated that she developed a new blockage right at the origin of that main artery. Um, and you think it was caused by the valve itself, uh, which I'll show you a picture of here. Um, there's a scaffolding that was blocking the flow down the coronary artery. Um, again, she was a poor surgical candidate. She had surgery in the past. She had a mechanical micro valve, which is a different valve. Um, she had some complications with infections based on that. And her heart function was severely depressed. Um, so she wouldn't have been able to survive um, any kind of surgery on her heart. Um, so this is what her angiogram looked like in the cath lab. Um, this is her tower valve. So uh, the valve that we put in through the um, catheter uh, has a scaffolding. It has like a you know, lattice that the, the valve is sutured inside uh, the scaffolding. And then we uh, embed it into the aorta. So the valve is sitting inside of this uh, scaffolding. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, the scaffolding itself blocked up her main artery. Uh, this is uh, her main coronary artery, and it's being blocked by the scaffolding of the aorta, and she's got a very severe blockage right at the origin of that. Uh, this is the impeller device in place. Um, so she wasn't getting any blood flow to her heart, which made her heart weak. Uh, using the impeller, we were able to go through the side of the scaffolding, put a stent in there, and we expand that artery. Uh, there's really no blockage left there at this point. And we reestablish blood flow to her heart. And uh, she's not a normal flow through her main artery. Um, during this procedure, she actually got a blockage in the femoral artery in her leg, but it was on the other side. We put the impellion on the left leg, this is her right leg. But we were able to go in and balloon that open and reestablish flow to her femoral artery. Sort of a minor glitch from this procedure. <clears throat> but uh, she did great with a stent in her left main with impella support. Um, again, we had an angioplasty, her right femoral artery, but um, I talked to her on the phone just yesterday. She's doing great now. Um, her heart failure is completely resolved. She's symptom free. She's living a normal life. And her heart function returned to normal. She increased in functioning at 10 to 15 percent. Her heart function is now back to normal. We had a BP doctor cardiogram performed just last week, and um, just like nothing ever happened to her, so she's doing great. Yes? No, we just use it during the procedure. And then as soon as the procedure's over, we take it out. Yeah. So it's just there for backup. That allows us to work on the heart. Okay. So normally, if you didn't have the pump in for backup, uh, while you were doing the procedure, you have to open up the artery. If you put a lot of stress on the heart, you're interrupting the heart's blood flow. And if someone has uh, a weak heart to begin with, um, they most likely wouldn't even survive um, having us work on their heart. So, so it doesn't stay in long term. I mean, some patients we do leave it in for a couple of days. 
Uh, but those are different kinds. That's not protected PCI. That's a different indication. So if someone comes in with uh, cardiogenic shock. Um, they had a big heart attack. Um, you know, maybe they have um, uh, contracted a, a problem that makes their heart rate weak. We can't leave it in for a couple of days. Um, but uh, for this particular procedure that I've been talking about, this is just to assist. Uh, it helps us. Uh, work on the heart and open up the arteries. All right, great. Um, so um, we started a formal program here. They had the impella uh, before we got here, but um, they didn't really have a formal program for protecting the sky, and they didn't use it very frequently. Um, so we started this program in 2016. Um, so we review every case uh, before we do it. Uh, plan it out ahead of time, um, you know, work together as a team to optimize their outcomes, um, and then we, result it, we uh, track our results to make sure that everything's going well and you know, we're treating people appropriately and they're having good outcomes. Um, my partners are Dr. Patrick Magnus and Dr. Sean Masavi. Um, again, we work together as a team to um, optimize outcomes on the folks we treat. Uh, our nurse coordinator is Carrie Armani. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without her. She's fantastic. She uh, works with all the patients and uh, keeps track of everybody and uh, makes sure we're following everybody very closely. Also, our cath lab staff does a great job. They're all highly trained professionals and support us to do a terrific job. And we wouldn't be able to do this without them. And then the nurses and staff and the ICU and the PCU. So. It's all part of a team effort to um, you know, optimize care for the folks in these years. Um, so in the past uh, two plus years, we've done 48 patients this way. Um, all of our cases have been successful. Uh, we've been able to open all the blockages that we've worked on. Uh, we've had no major adverse events related to the impella itself. Um, some patients have had adverse outcomes, but it wasn't related to the impella. It was related to maybe another medical condition that they had, or they had kidneys, or had lungs, but it had nothing to do with the impeller of the work that we did on their heart. Uh, we have had a couple patients with internal bleeding uh, that were self-limiting. We didn't have to go in and surgically correct it. Um, we were able to treat it just with medications. Um, we have two hematomas, so bleeding under the skin. The device we use is fairly big. And um, sometimes there's a little bleeding around the device, or when we take the device out, there's some bleeding out of the skin. But again, that tends not to be a major complication. It's usually self-limited. We had one patient with worsening heart failure. Again, we were able to manage that with medications, and then that femoral angioplasty had only about six patients that required blood transfusions. But for the most part, we're quite pleased that uh, we've had some minor complications, but uh, you know, major events. And again, these are patients who probably wouldn't be with us today um, if we didn't have this device to help us. Yeah. Um, so in conclusion, um, the protected PCI allows us to um, do coronary intervention safely. Uh, we can do this procedure on sicker patients who we would otherwise be able to do a procedure on. It allows us to work on more complex uh, patients with complex anatomy and patients who are not surgical candidates, and patients who really wouldn't have any other options if it wasn't for this device and this program. Um, it allows us to more completely revascularize the patients, so we're able to open up more arteries, uh, work on main arteries, and uh, work on patients with multiple blockages that we wouldn't be able to do without this pump. Uh, it protects the heart during the procedure, so it allows us to do more extensive work we can do procedures like using a drill in the heart that we wouldn't be able to use without this um, to take over the, the pumping action of the heart while we're working on the patient. Um, it makes it more stable during the procedure. There's fewer complications related to the procedure, and most importantly, it really improves patient outcomes and their quality of life. Yeah, that's all I really have. <laughs> Yeah, I found that online. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are you patient? <laughs> 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 so, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to. Yes. Could you speak a little 
little more about the registry and research that is ongoing? Sure. Um, so there's a lot of different research um, being conducted um, through Abiomed, which is the maker of the pump. Um, they're a big company that has a lot of mechanical support devices. This is just one of them. Um, they did some research initially comparing this device to other support devices that showed this one was superior to uh, other support devices like the balloon pump. And that's where a lot of that data I showed you came from. <coughs> um, they're actually doing some other trials with patients who have cardiogenic shock. Um, so they have a big heart attack and they come in and their heart is not working well at all. Uh, they can't even supply enough uh, blood pressure to diffuse their bodies. And so we put the pump in to support that. Um, you know, and those are patients who usually have to pump in for longer. They might have to pump in for a few days. Um, so there's a big registry um, looking at patients with cardiogenic shock all across the country. Um, and we're tracking outcomes using the pump in those patients. Um, they have other research studies ongoing um, for treating heart attacks uh, using the pump to assist patients who are having heart attacks who may not be in shock. Um, there are some trials ongoing with that as well. Um, yes, sir. How can, you, how can you work on the valve if, if you have the casualty going into the ventricle? Right, so we don't use the pump to support valve work. Um, we use it for coronaries. So um, the catheter goes into the ventricle, and then we work on the coronary arteries, which uh, come off the aorta, and then they, feed, they run along the surface of the heart. Um, so where the device, the outlet of the device sits, it actually sits below the coronary artery, so it can shoot some of the blood out to your body, but also shoot some down the coronaries. Uh, the valve picture I showed you, uh, we put in the valve first, and then the pump went in after. So um, we couldn't use this device if we were uh, put, putting in a valve. It did stuff. So. Put the valve in first? Right. A lot of these things. How do you control the blood flow? Um, you can't. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the valve procedure itself, uh, we only, it only takes us about, once we get the valve in place, it only takes us about five seconds to put the valve in. So, for that five seconds, the patient doesn't get any blood flow to their heart. Um, so, we, we put the valve in place, we get everything where we want it, and then when we deploy that valve, we we expand it and we block blood flow for about five seconds. And then we, <clears throat> when we deflate the balloon, the patient has a normal valve left. Um, so they get much better flow once the valve is in place. But your, your heart can tolerate a few seconds of not getting any blood flow. The patients respond, you know, they rebound very quickly. The patient you showed didn't have the valve in Right. That was done before, right? That was done before, and then we used the pump afterwards. Right. You couldn't use this pump to help you put the valve in. Yes. Of the forty-eight cases that you've done in the past two years, can you, is there any trend uh, or most male or female or you know, MCA range or what? I know that there are yeah. complex issues heart-wise, but is sure. A, um, I didn't compile that information for this talk. Uh, we could get that information for you. Uh, yeah, we have them all tracked and we report them all to the National Cath Data Registry. So we report it all to the NCBR. I have that information. I didn't compile it for this uh, talk, but uh, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay, I, I, they're older. I mean, they're, the six year old I showed you is unusual. Most of them are older than that, 70s, 80s. Um, it's probably a mix of men and women. Yes? So the 60-year-old, where the device blocked the blood flow, right. would there have been a way to know that before the patient failed? And so, what would you have been looking for? 
So when we first put the valve in, we did do an angiogram of the aorta, and her flow was normal at that point. So what we think happened was uh, that scaffold uh, irritated the ostium of her left vein, and we think that she developed fibrous tissue um, just because that device was sitting there and it was rubbing against the origin. Uh, when we first put the valve in, um, it looked great. There was no blockage, and then that developed over time, over uh, seven or eight months. Um, so something must have happened in the meantime. She doesn't have atherosclerosis, so it's not cholesterol built up. Uh, so, well, I mean, we didn't go in there and you know, take a sample of it. It wasn't safe to do that. But most likely it was fibrosis that occurred, and we were just able to put a stent in there and be expected. So, I just have one more question. How, how far back do you look to say, you know, three years ago these patients would have died? We wouldn't have been able to do anything for them. Right. And this is, is it, is it two years that we're looking at? Is it five years? Is it 10, 20 years? Um, well, the technology keeps evolving. Um, this particular device that I showed you has been around for about you know, four or five years. Um, they have newer devices coming along. Um, you know, we know from uh, registry data, for instance, um, the registries have been around for four or five years. Um, the clinical trials were conducted, um, I think in 2012 is when the clinical trials came out. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's kind of an evolving technology that keeps changing. And every time a new technology comes out, of course, or, or a substantial change in the technology, you have to start all over again. Because, you're going to get different outcomes. Um, so it's always a moving target. Um, we, we've been tracking these folks you know, since the origin. Uh, so it, it, it's, um, you know, a lot of folks end up having other problems. I mean, we fix their heart, but they have other medical problems. Uh, but, uh, you know, we fix their heart. <coughs> We're able to substantially improve what their functional status and uh, activities they can engage in and really go back to living normal lives um, unless something else comes up. Any other questions? Okay. Great, Laura, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. started several new programs since I got here just in the last two to three years. Um, I mean, I've been here since late 2015, but we sort of, it takes some time to get a new program up and running. But yeah, a lot of these things, putting in valves and uh, you know, using this pump, we wouldn't have been able to do here you know, three years ago. Yeah. yeah, and there's more coming too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have a lot of new uh, things we want to do as well. We want to keep expanding the services and you know, having more available to the communities. Yeah. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay. Hey,